This is the first of four events that we're having over the next few months to launch this book on decoding Southeast Asian art in honor of, and we're very pleased he's with us here today, Achampiria Krakesh, who has been a leading figure in Southeast Asian art over many, many decades. This is the book cover as we've come up with it. And I'd like to just take a moment to remind of some of the publications of Acha Imperia over the years. We come up here after completing his degree at Harvard University. He then, before that, he'd also studied in the United States in Bloomington, Indiana, the Royal College of Art in London, and had been at many, many other schools throughout England and in Europe as well. He's now professor of art history at Thomasat and president of the Pira Krakesh Foundation, as well as from 1999, the, a senior research scholar with the Thailand Research Fund, one of the key funders of research. And in fact, I, I can mention among the, among the countries of Southeast Asia, really, I think Thailand stands out in the degree to which the government and foundations are able to enable research to be undertaken on the region. If we, what I wanted to do was then move on to encourage you. These are selected publications, but you can see they go here over many, many years. The last one looking at Renaissance lectures in honor of Her Royal Highness Princess Maha Sirindor on her 50th, 50th, fifth cycle anniversary that came out through the Siam Society in 2018. And then a review article on the Lost Kingdoms exhibition that was at, in the Metropolitan Museum in the journal, the Siam Society. And you remember earlier in his CV, there's been many, many links through the, I think one of the oldest perhaps, and certainly most eminent research societies, the journal, the Siam Society in Bangkok. And then going back to Prapatom Chedi, other articles, um, selected articles on the occasion of another fifth cycle anniversary, more review articles. And then this book, our current book, which is coming out soon, is going to be published by River Books in Bangkok. This one also was in 2012, a seminal book that I'll turn over in a minute to Acha Imperia, hoping he might just say a word about his argument within this book. I think it, it stands apart and in, in also following his very distinctive voice throughout his long, long academic career. Heritage protection, so not just strictly art history. Textiles, ancestral textiles, Indian influences, looking at the Suryotai, the history of Ayutthaya arts. And I hope we can put this online afterwards as well. Dating controversies, and I think this is also a characteristic of Acha Imperia. He is not afraid of controversy. He's a man with very distinctive ideas, which I, I quite admire. We often struggle to, to really take a position, but he does it without out fear and sticks with it always, although he's open to further discussion. If I keep going back and looking at some of the much earlier ones, I actually move back through my own career of remembering many, many times when I was searching for a source, a reliable source, but one that might give me a fresh approach for writing and for teaching on the historiography of Thai art and how it, how it can best be periodized. In this one, again, he took on controversy in looking at the Ram Kamheng inscription and then I found one the other day when I was sent this and looking back to a much earlier book that I remember quite well um, in setting out some of the Thai reflections on American experiences. So a whole range of things. And I think he's, he's been a consistent and leading voice and one that we're very, very honored to have then been able to put together this book proposed, I think, originally by his student, Achan Pichita, who had hoped to be with us today, but had problems getting his visa. So 
My apologies for that. Our next event is at the Euroseas Conference in Paris, um, where we hope you, where he, we, we will meet. And then two book launches, a conference and a book launch in Bangkok in October. We have four different speakers this afternoon and we'll each introduce ourselves. I guess I'd like to ask perhaps if Acharn Piria would be, would you be willing to come up to the podium to say a word? Yes, that would be welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Just, just to say a word about yourself and what you're planning now. Because I think some of the audience, although we're a select audience, some don't know you. Yes, here, please, just to me. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to be invited here. Uh, for the decoding of Southeast Asian art, which many of us here uh, have kindly spent so much time writing, uh, contributing to this book, which will be very most useful for the study of Southeast Asian art. So I'm very uh, grateful for your contribution. Thank you very much. And now, uh, shall I introduce myself? Yes, yes well, my name is Piriya Kreiler. Mm -hmm. Even though King Wichira would insist upon calling it Kreirich. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, since he is given the surname Kreiler, then in parentheses, he's written in English, cry rich. So what can you do? <laughs> so, so it has to be cry rich in English and cry look in Thai. So that has to be my lot for the last 80 years. So um, I'm still working. I hope I will finish my next book, which is uh, is art history of Yutia. But uh, one of my friends who is the, uh, helping me with the, uh, the foundation suggests that if you want to write a book on art history of Yutia, why don't you write, include Sukhothai in it as well? And it's a wonderful idea, I never thought of it. But since I have been writing the Sukhothai and what the Siamese call Mương Nữa, or the northern part of the country, Sukhothai is uh, Sawan Kalok and Kampang Pet, in, they're all, which I have been re, uh, working all these years to say it is part of the UTR kingdom. So when you write this book, why don't you include it in? So I said, well, what a wonderful idea, I do that. So that's my next work, which I hope uh, to start soon. This is, this is my academic work. And I also go back to my painting. So literally I supported the foundation, not me, <laughs> supporting the, found, uh, the, the book publication by inviting people to sit for their portrait and contribute to the fundings of the publication of this book. So uh, Dr. Rivier has uh, suggested that why don't I include, or why don't the book include their portrait as well? So at, at the end of the book, you will have the portraits of the sponsors who contribute to the fundings of this book at a small stem-like portraits, which is better than none, actually. <laughs> oh, so I'm still working uh, for, uh, in portrait paintings to support the foundation. <laughs> so I can tell you that uh, I have never been busier. So I always think that life should begin at 80. <laughs> thank you. So. That's my no, thank you for introduction. Thank you. <laughs> we have we begin with 
Nicola Revere. Petar Chorn, do you want to introduce yourself now or when you when you talk? Okay. So Nicola, could I in invite you please to come and just say a brief word about yourself and some of the things that we have put together for the book? It's a wonderful volume. And I yes, and thank you very much. I, I hadn't I hadn't realized the portrait painting was ongoing as well, or the history, both of which we look forward to. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here and uh, thank you for coming all today from far away. Um, <clears throat> I suppose uh, I should introduce myself very briefly and uh, more specifically say a few words about the book, its content, uh, the genesis of it, and then I will uh, come <clears throat> to present my own contribution to this book. So uh, I'm born French, born in Paris, and I moved to uh, Bangkok about 20 years ago to work as an instructor at Tamaset University, Bangkok, which is the same university as uh, Atlan Pilia, where uh, we were colleagues at the time. Um, and um, as I moved there, I've been interested more and more in uh, the Southeast Asian, early Southeast Asian art, uh, more specifically pre-Thai uh, period, first millennium, and more specifically the Varvati, Central Thailand, Nakhon Patom, which was also the uh, topic of Ajahn Piliya's uh, PhD dissertation some uh, long time ago at Harvard. So that actually, uh, I follow the steps of Ajahn Pilia, and we may sometimes disagree, but that is fine. Um, <clears throat> and I'm very happy and honored to have been uh, approached by my colleague, uh, Ajahn Pichaya, who is not with us today, uh, but uh, to, with the idea of bringing this first script uh, together. And it's nearly ready. We have a mock-up copy here, if you'd like to have a look uh, when we have a break. Um, <clears throat> it's going to press next month. So just in time for Ajahn Pilia's birthday uh, next month. And we will have an official book launch uh, in Bangkok, should you be there on September 8th, I believe it's scheduled. And a few other promotional events uh, in Bangkok and Chiang Mai as well. So, um, and today is part of it. Uh, I would call it a soft uh, launch book launch. So here's the flyer. You can uh, have uh, one of those uh, if you don't have one already. And perhaps I can say a few words on the contributors and the contributions, as you can see here. So in order, um, so we approached over about two years ago when this uh, book project uh, first started, we approached uh, as many people as we could think of working on early Southeast Asian art, mostly a bit of archeology span and related uh, fields. And uh, it's clearly, as you can see from the list, uh, an international uh, uh, project with many international scholars from all over the place, including also a few Thai local uh, scholars as well. And uh, some of the people in this list uh, have been, uh, uh, I've known Ajahn Pilia for many, many years. Others may never have met Ajahn Pilia physically, but uh, we can say, I can say that all of us have been inspired by Ajahn Pilia's work. And uh, I try to, as the lead editor, I try to uh, present this list. Um, so the first, maybe I say, should say a few words on each. Uh, the first two uh, uh, essays in this volume discuss very specifically the life and work of Ajahn Pilia uh, from his, uh, I wouldn't say childhood, but uh, his uh, youth in uh, Europe uh, and then in America, when uh, Pilia started to work on uh, switch from the work of uh, art, fine arts, paintings to uh, art history, and then discussing the uh, 
new approach of Ajahn Pilia to art history in the field. So that's the first contribution. So kind of a biographical um, contribution. And the second, similarly, but more focused on the few years where Ajahn Pilia were uh, as a curator of Asian art at the National uh, Gallery of Australia in Canberra, okay? And then we're moving randomly uh, on, uh, but more or less chronologically from the very ancient period, from the Bronze Age, as you can see with Dr. Paul on the so-called frog drums of Southeast Asia, sometimes called Dongson drums. Uh, so we have a, a nice contribution here. And then moving on to the territory of Indianization and, you know, the, the, the the movements of uh, Buddhist art from India to Southeast Asia with Dr. Brown. And then we reach in the land of gold, I suppose, the Suwanabumi, uh, Thailand specifically, with a few contributions on central Thailand. So one by architects uh, on the site of Pong Tuk in Kanchanaburi province. So that's more or less an, uh, an architectural uh, study. Uh, with new interpretations and then myself which you will hear in a moment and then moving to southern thailand peninsular thailand the region of satin pra and nakon sitamalat on different aspects so vishnu vaishnava imagery in the first case with dr paul levy and then uh, a look at the chronicles, the traditional text uh, discussing the uh, coming of the relics uh, of the Buddha into Nakhon Sitamalat by uh, Atlan Sam or Wanda Sam. And then we are uh, still in Maritime Southeast Asia discussing the iconography of Avalokiteshvara. Uh, focusing on a tiger skin um, that you may see sometimes on the dotti of Avalokiteshvara images. Uh, then moving to central Java with a study on reliefs, new interpretation of the data from the reliefs in uh, Borobudur and Pambanan by Dr. Ong. And then back to Thailand, the Northeast, and including Laos and Cambodia with uh, Dr. Murphy discussing the Sima stones, a topic which was dear to Ajahn Pilia as well. He has been working on that too. And then uh, uh, with an excursus into Upper Laos with uh, Dr. Lauriard, who will be in Paris next week, uh, in a few days, uh, discussing the possibility of a Khmer uh, influences in Upper Laos in uh, pre-15th century. And then we have uh, Dr. Sharok discussing uh, the iconography of Amitabha in Angkor, and Dr. Sharok would be with us in a moment. And then uh, Elizabeth Moore, Professor Moore, who will uh, make her presentation right after me on the uh, relic traditions in Myanmar or uh, around Pagan uh, area, upper, upper, upper Burma. Uh, Dr. Chatula Wong from Silpakon University in Bangkok, an architect, is focusing on the Ananda Temple at Pagan. Then we have uh, Dr. Baptiste from the Guimet Museum in Paris, uh, who is reassessing, um, reconsidering, I should say, it's a uh, um, kind of histori historiographical uh, review of uh, the works on the uh, Brahmanical bronzes, whether they are from the Sukhothai period or the Ayutthaya period. And then we have Dr. Listopad focusing on the uh, reign of uh, King Narai, the second half of the 17th century in, during the Ayutthaya uh, period and the uh, influence of Iranian or Persian influence at the time. 
And then we have uh, Chris Baker and uh, Professor Pasuk, husband and wife, discussing the murals traditions in late Ayutthaya period. So, um, where am I? Okay, uh, Atlan Pichaya from Chiang Mai University, uh, continuing in the late uh, Ayutthaya period discussing uh, the uh, temple uh, arrangement and focusing temple architecture in late Ayutthaya period. And then uh, Ms. Pim Papai and husband Jeffrey Sung discussing the uh, ceramics, uh, sino Thai ceramics of the late Ayutthaya period. Uh, Dr. Woodward uh, from the uh, Emeritus Curator from Baltimore, Walters Art Gallery, discussing Benjarong, uh, new uh, interpretations on some Benjarong work from the early Ratanakosin period or early Bangkok period, if you will. There is also a fine uh, appendix to that by another scholar discussing the uh, uh, one of the inscribed, the Benjarong inscribed in Arabic with a date. So that's quite interesting too. And then we have uh, Professor Lefford and uh, Louise Court uh, discussing uh, stoneware production, mostly in Issa, Northeast Thailand, and a bit to Laos as well from the 19th century onwards. And uh, Lidom Lefford would be with us in Paris in a few days. And Olivier de Bernon, Professor de Bernon, a Khmer scholar, mostly textual scholar, but it was quite interesting to have his input on legends concerning uh, God Ganesha, you know, the elephant-headed uh, God, and some legends from Cambodia to understand the imagery as well. And uh, Ajahn Pat here present, uh, discussing the iconography of the earth goddess, Pame Tolani, and she'll be giving a presentation later today. And uh, Dr. Rone discussing the uh, monkey uh, character in the Ramakien or Ramayana, Thai Ramayana, uh, moving from <coughs> Thai or Siam at the time and Burma, the iconography of two sites. Uh, Adlan Supamon from Chiang Mai University is uh, discussing Western influence in late 19th, early 20th century in uh, temples and buildings in the North, mostly Chiang Mai, but also Chiang Tung in today's Shan States. And then Professor Boats uh, will discuss old photographs from the years uh, of 1865, 1866. That is during the time of King Mongkut or Rama IV. And what we can tell about these old photographs. And then Professor Reynolds, Craig Reynolds, discuss a specific Buddha imagery from the reign, late reign of the, the reign of the late uh, King Bumipol in the 1960s. And then we have Professor McDaniel from the US discussing modern Buddhist practice and decorative art. And finally, about some words about contemporary uh, Thai artists with uh, Sebastian Tayak from Chiang Mai University as well. So as you can see, we have a good spread out from the ancient period to the modern, to the contemporary days. And it's quite representative of uh, mainland Southeast Asia with a bit of insular maritime. My only uh, regret is we don't have anything about Vietnam, uh, but otherwise I'm quite happy with that list. Uh, originally, there were even more people than this. Uh, fortunately, not everybody could make it, but I think here with 30 chapters, we have a great uh, volume uh, here. 
So that is a few words about the forthcoming uh, Fed shift. Perhaps you have some questions at this point and we, which we can uh, discuss before I, I start with my presentation. It's just to say that, yes, I mean, in, in, in complementary terms, it's, it's an extraordinary book. And I think that it represents a tribute to Atra Imperia's dedication, but also his diversity and the ways that the questions reach out across the region. So an exciting production to have up. Our first actual formal presentation today is by Dr. Professor, <laughs> Dr. Professor Nicola Revere. Assistant um, professor. Assistant professor, who, who gets honor a place for getting on the cover of our book as well. So I read through his article last night, an extraordinary study that, yes, I very much look forward to hearing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. So welcome back. Um, so we're looking at the time, but it looks like we will be fine with four speakers. Maybe we'll give a short break after two speakers. Yeah. Um, so my uh, chapter uh, dedicated to this volume for Jampilia is titled The Dvaravati Relief at Watsuta, Bangkok and its Indian Roots. Uh, the uh, very idea for this uh, contribution uh, came rather recently when uh, we finally agreed with the Piria Kayuk Foundation on the book cover, which you see here, which is the relief that I'm going to talk about at Watsuta, Bangkok, okay? So originally I had another uh, chapter idea, but since I didn't start to write until more recently, I thought I would uh, rather discuss this very interesting relief. And this is what I'm going to do now. <clears throat> so probably many of you who have, uh, uh, who have been to Bangkok uh, are aware of what's the royal temple in the very center uh, of Ratanakosin from the mid 19th century, completed in the mid 19th century. And as you enter the main Vihan or Vihara, uh, audience hall, as we can say, and as you look at the main Pa Si Sakyamuni image, uh, if you turn around on the back, you would see uh, encrusted on its base the relief that I'm going to talk about. You will see pictures in a moment. Okay, so what you see here on the book cover is the before uh, the recent renovation. So here is the gilded version, okay? As uh, we all knew it until very recently, I think around sometime in 2021, I'm not exactly sure when, it was uh, the, all the gilded, was removed and it now appears in its original limestone gray, grayish color. It's rather high, but 2.40, 2 meters, 40 centimeters in height. And it's divided in two registers, narrative registers. The first register, which is the lower register, you have to look from bottom to top. Uh, moving upward, is depicting the story or episode from the life of the Buddha uh, called the Great Miracle, okay, Mahapatiyalaya in Sanskrit, at the city of Shravasti in northern India, or Jambudvipa as we know it in text. I'll come to more details about it very soon. And as you move upwards, it's divided uh, by a uh, bar. The uh, upper register shows you the Buddha enthroned on the seat or the throne of the Lord of Gods, known as Indra, 
or chakra or saka or pain, depending on different pronunciation, different languages, the Lord of Gods on, uh, in its palace on top of Mount Meru uh, on the, at the, uh, on the even of the 33 called uh, Tayastrimsha in Sanskrit or Tavatimsa or Tavadun. And what is the Buddha doing there? He is basically teaching to the gods, the devas, and also to his deceased mother, uh, princess or queen Maya Devi, who passed away about seven days after the Buddha's birth. We, so we are told in the text, okay? So again, so sometime during the life of the Buddha, a great miracle appears. This is the lower register after which the Buddha is said to have ascended in three steps, uh, three strides to uh, the heaven of the 33, to teach the cause and to teach to the Dhamma to his mother as well. So that is just to pinpoint what's written on the map, right in the middle, as you can see, in the middle of Ratanakosin, the uh, ancient, uh, the old quarters of Bangkok, which originally was an island. Um, and Ratanakosin means basically the jewel of Indra. Okay. This is a view, an outside view of the main Vion at Watsutat. So, very beautiful place. You probably have been. So, as you go in and you enter, and you see Prasi Sakyamuni, Buddha image, uh, about 10, 8, 10 meters, I forgot, in height, uh, in bronze, said to come from Sukhothai. And yeah, beautiful Buddha images. It was removed from the uh, upcountry to uh, the new capital in the early 19th century. And mural paintings are also beautiful all around, and they depict not just the life of the Buddha, but they also depicts uh, the uh, cosmology, the various heavens and hells and continents, etc., according to the Buddhist cosmology. So really, when you enter what's with that, uh, symbolically, you are at the top of Mount Meru and you are envisioning the whole universe. So turning around right on the back, <clears throat> uh, you could see perhaps, as you see here, this is the, the back of the Pasi Sakyamuni image. And so here you see the relief with the two registers, lower register, the great miracle and the upper register, uh, the preaching of Dharma in, uh, on top of Mount Meru. So again, this picture was taken before 2021. And this is how it looks like nowadays in 2022. So all the gilded has been removed. And I will show you some close-up photographs. So here you see the lower register, the Buddha preaching. So as you can see here, the Buddha is enthroned with his legs down, a posture called Badrasana in Sanskrit, the auspicious or royal posture. The Buddha is preaching with his right hand, it's so-called Vidalka and gesture, very common in Dvarati art. In fact, it is actually unknown in Indian art, uh, almost in association with this uh, and then leg posture. And I call this posture, you know, a majestic posture. So the Buddha is preaching in majesty to the audience. So who is the, in the audience at the time at Shravasti? Well, we have the king, uh, the place named Pasenadjit in Sanskrit, Pasenadjit in Bali with his court. Okay, so here they are, 
all the library. And uh, as you look on the right, you see the heretics, uh, including the leader of the heretics here, naked, named in the text Pulana Kashyapa, so Kashyapa the older. And to make a long story short, after the great miracle, everybody was amazed and everybody converted to the words of the Buddha, except Pulana Kashyapa who lost his face and went to, into drawing in the nearby river, okay? Interesting details here, uh, below the feet of the Buddha. You can see the, the Buddha's feet uh, very often, nearly always, uh, are uh, on a lotus, a lotus stalk upheld by a Nagaraja or a serpent king in human form. Let's see, too bad Peter is not here, he loves Naga. Uh, well, so here's a nice one, the Naga hood around the face of the Naga king. There's only one here. And as I will uh, show you in the text, there should be two. Okay, so some discrepancy with the text, textual tradition here. Um, above the real Buddha, Shakyamuni or Gautama, you see doubles of himself. These are just nimitta. They are just emanations through his magical powers. He can multiply himself in the sky all over the place. So this is the great show. This is the great miracle that we are talking about. Buddha images depicted uh, in different posture, seated, cross-legged, or even pendant-legged, reclining, standing, walking, etc. And all of these Buddha images are in a posture of preaching or meditating and so on and so forth. You can even see a bit to the top left and the top right, Buddha images actually touching the sun and the moon. So this is how far this multiplication of Buddhas goes into the, the sky. And what you see here is very interesting, is all this is happening under a tree. And this tree with the fruits, you may, you may guess, is a mango tree, okay? Important detail. The upper register, here again, the Buddha enthroned, and this time the Buddha is not enthroned on earth, he's on top of Mount Meru. So basically he just kicked out the Lord of Gods from his throne, that is Indra, and the Buddha is sitting literally in place of Lord Indra. And he's preaching to the gods, attended by fly whisking attendants here. And his mother, uh, on the, seated on the uh, lower left. Um, interesting detail because the texts say uh, the mother, um, Queen Maya Devi, when she was reborn, she re was reborn in the heaven of Bodhisattva in Tusita as a male. But here she's represented as a female. So these are some of the details that are quite interesting. Okay, so what are the texts saying? Well, the Pali tradition uh, that we know today in Theravada Buddhism, uh, Shravasti becomes Savati in Pali, and it is known there as the twin miracle, Yamaka Patiyaliya, because there is an extra add-on to it where the Buddha emanate flames, fire from his shoulders and water from his uh, hands and uh, the main uh, source for the great miracle of Shavasti comes from 
the Dhammapada documentary. You have the reference here. And interestingly, in the Pali tradition, all this is happening below a mango tree. Okay, as we have seen, uh, you may remember in the relief at Wetsutat. So here is a modern depiction of a great miracle at Sabati. This is a mural painting from Wetsutat, which I took. And um, Wetsutat, you have depictions on the outer walls of the life of the Buddhas of the past. So not just one Buddha, not just Siddhartha Gautama, but all the past Buddhas before him. And basically the story repeats itself. It's basically the same episodes, just happening at different uh, time in succession. But what the texts say is that all Buddhas in the past and in the future will have to perform the great miracle at Savati or Shravasti. Okay. So this is a common topic uh, repeated over and over again. Looking at other uh, traditions from, in Sanskrit, we have a nice uh, recension collected in the uh, Divya Vedana, the, the divine stories. One chapter of it is dedicated to the great miracle, and that is the Sanskrit version. And there are some major differences with the Pali account. Um, the differences between basically the Pali and the Sanskrit tradition here is that the mango tree does not appear in the Sanskrit tradition here. However, the Nagarajas appear in the Sanskrit tradition too, normally, known as Nanda and Upananda, uh, beholding the stalk of the lotus under the feet of the Buddha. And the Nagarajas don't appear in a Pali account. And there is a passage here, uh, I underline with my emphasis, that specify the posture of the seated Buddha as he was performing his great miracle. So this is the translated version and the Sanskrit passage, which was uh, important to me during my research on postures of the Buddha, Bhagavan Palyanka Nishana, translated as the Buddha sat in Palyanka. That is the Sanskrit term. Now, what is Palyanka? In this context, narrative context is clearly cross-legged. Okay, So the Buddha was supposed to sit in a cross-legged posture and then make his performance. So that is what we have in the Sanskrit account published in the Divya Vedana, collected in the Divya Vedana. Okay. But what we have here uh, in central Thailand, <clears throat> again, I forgot to mention the Watsuta relief we have today in Bangkok, of course, does not come from Bangkok. It originally comes from Nakhon Patom and it was brought over uh, in the mid 19th century into Bangkok, just like this one. This is another example, also coming from Nak uh, probably Nakhon Patom. I think it says that to come from what Shin Ayutthaya I couldn't find this place and I'm a bit cautious, but most likely, again, uh, originally this uh, relief uh, came from the area of Nakhon Patom today. It represents similarly the great miracle of Shravasti or Savati, very close to the Watsuta relief with some slight differences. The uh, Buddha is similarly enthroned, pendant legged the right hand gesture preaching with the audience of uh, royal audience to the right, the heretics to the left of the Buddha at this feet and the mango tree. Here. You can see a mango tree or it looks like it's quite uh, same. Uh, 
incidentally, there are a few miniature replicas of this uh, stair from Nakon Patom. This is from the Met, a replica, probably a modern, modern uh, artifacts. Okay. Now, the main point is here, before I turn to the Indian material, to look at the roots of this iconography, is that to, to sum up what I've seen so far, it looks like the uh, Watsutat relief here draws its inspiration, inspiration from various sources. So this, we have to think, it could be textual sources, but we just don't have the text, original text anymore. We cannot say that it came from straight from the Pali Canon, doesn't work. Even though we have the mango tree appearing here, there are some other details that will tell us that it cannot be the Pali uh, Canon. It cannot be drawn directly from the Sanskrit account known uh, as we have it today as well. So it's a mix. It's a mix of Sanskrit, Pali. So there's two possibilities in my, in my view. Either it comes from another text, if such a text existed, but we don't have it anymore. Or more likely, it was just a mix. The, you know, the artist uh, didn't really follow uh, the text. Uh, and perhaps we have to think of oral tradition as well. Okay, and so the main message I want to convey here is that the uh, sources are not known, but probably a mix of different things. And interestingly for my work is the posture. I want, now I want to focus on the posture of the Buddha and throne as a king or even as a god. And for this, I have to go back to India. Mainly from the Western India, the caves of Ajanta. I will look at a few examples from cave two, cave 16 and 17, where the great miracle of Shravasti is depicted, where the Buddha's teaching of the Dharma on top of Mount Meru is depicted, and also the successive episode uh, when the Buddha is descending from Mount Meru at Sam Kashi, according to Indian tradition, because all of this is a cycle, same cycle. Okay, it is said that at the beginning of the rainy season, the great miracle at Shravasti appeared. Then the Buddha took three steps, climbed up on top of Mount Meru, spent there a rainy season, a few months, and at the end of the rainy season, he came down on Earth. Uh, back at some Kashya. Okay, so one cycle, narrative cycle. So this is unfortunately, I don't have original photographs. They are very difficult to photograph and they are a bit faded. So I will only show uh, line drawings here from Cave 2, Ajanta, dated from the third to the fourth quarter of the fifth century, according to Walter Spink's uh, short chronology, which I follow. So this is a mural painting, probably depicting the great miracle at Shravasti, as we see from the number of Buddhas up in the sky and the main preaching uh, Buddha here with other attendants. Uh, you will notice that the main preaching Buddha is always in Badrasana, the uh, majestic posture. The only difference with Dvarvati art is the hand posture. In India, you will have the two hands uh, at the chest level joined together, the so-called Dharma Chakra uh, Mudra, whereas in Dvarvati art, it will be always the right hand. <clears throat> uh, here we can take a parallel with Canary, an example from Canary Cave 89 perhaps slightly later, Canary north of Bombay, where we have an example, maybe this is also a depiction of the great miracle, the central Buddha, see the Nagarajas at the bottom, and 
a tree on top with maybe some tiny fruits, which may or may not be the mango trees. I'm not entirely sure, but it has been argued as such. Cave 16, an example, nice example here of the Buddha preaching to uh, the gods, to the people. We can also notice the appearance of Vajrapani here in this case, Vajrapani, the uh, one of the Bodhisattva with the Vajra in his hand. Uh, I don't have a pointer, sorry. Another example from also Cave 16, you can see the Nagarajas down below. Here it's uh, two episodes. So uh, the preaching in heaven and then the descending of uh, the Buddha in Samkhya. Cave 16. And this is a very nice one where you see one, two, three successive episodes from top to bottom in this case, um, the preaching to the gods and to his mother at the top, then the descending Buddha at Sankasha, and finally the sermon at Sankasha. So one, two, three different successive episodes. So uh, of course, more details in the, in the, in the paper, uh, but uh, Overall, I find out that around the late 5th century till maybe the early 8th century in this period, especially in the Western Indian caves, the Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, I think, is very often, almost always, in fact, depicted preaching in Badrasana or the uh, majestic posture because he is represented as a Chakravati, a universal monarch, or a Dharma Raja, a, a king of Dharma. So he is sitting on the lion throne with the Makaras. And he is also, as the story tells us, narrative, seated on the throne of uh, Lord Indra, the Lord of Gods. And by doing this, Basically, the Buddha takes the attributes and power in the Ya, in Sanskrit, uh, of the Lord of Gods and rule over the universe, rule over the man, the devas, and teach the Dharma. So here I apply this uh, fancy Greek terminology, uh, Pantokrator, which came to my mind, I mean, I was, as, as you look at early Christian art, you see this Christ in majesty, seated in majesty, Pantocrator, ruler of all, okay? I think it applies also very well to the Buddha in this case. And uh, here is one fine example from another cave in Maharashtra, uh, Kala, could be late fifth, early sixth century, where you see the majestic Buddha, uh, Pantokrator, preaching probably on top of Mount Meru, upheld, uh, uplifted by the uh, Nagas, Nagaraja, down the bottom. You see the wheel on top of the pillar with the two deer, so that may represent the earth plane. This could be the underworld plane and the celestial plane, so kind of a division here of the three realms in terms of cosmology. And on top, very interestingly, you see some flying uh, celestials, angels, carrying a crown. So they are about to crown the Buddha, okay? It will only take a few centuries to uh, start to find the first crowned or bijewal Buddhas, okay? But in this point, sixth century, not yet, but it's coming. But the idea is there, the concept is there. The Buddha is Pantokrator and is about to be crowned, okay? Just as Indra, okay? Indra is the prototype uh, of uh, all uh, kings uh, in, in, in Indian coronation tradition. 
And to finish, I will uh, give you an example, a more uh, much later uh, <clears throat> example coming from Thailand, a Pali text known as Buddha Pada Mangala, supposed to describe the motifs and symbols found on the Buddha's footprints, uh, Buddha Padas. And uh, as you can see here, come, uh, the nice example from Wat Po in Bangkok, you see all these symbols, okay? One of them at the center, of course, is Mont Meru and the palace of Indra, okay? And one of the symbol is described here, it's the Baddha Pitta in Pali. Pitta or Asana are synonyms. So Baddha Pitta or Baddhasana is, is translated here as the stately throne. And it is described as a precious seat called red marble stone, the long name in Pali. And it said that the blessed one or the Buddha was sitting on this red marble stone seat in a rim of the 33 devas, that is the Triasimsha, heaven, to teach the Dhamma to the deities and also to his mother. Okay, so I found this a very nice uh, way to uh, put, bring back this topic to more uh, modern, uh, uh, more modern environment in Thailand. So to conclude, we have seen briefly here how this uh, Watsutad relief uh, coming from Nakhon Patom, or the, 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 what I think is the Dvarati uh, core uh, of this uh, polity, uh, how it goes back, the concept goes back to Indian, uh, Western Indian uh, iconography and concepts of uh, royal glory and supremacy. So the uh, Badrasana posture here, I think was used as a propagandist visual device to display the power, omnipotent power of the Buddha, Shakyamuni. Thank you very much. Some questions now or questions? comments uh, we, perhaps what i would suggest is we could have a few quick ones pointed one and of course we we'll, would love to hear from adan pelia and uh, we can save some time later on at the end for more general discussion okay so a few minutes please uh, in my invitation letter i was asked to be a discussant so I had to do a lot of work. <laughs> so excuse me, uh, since I have to do my duty as a discussion, I, of course, well, I don't have to tell you what a discussion is supposed to be do to doing, but one of the things is to suggest uh, uh, um, uh, discussions and what he could improve upon or he could take a different view and all that. So to, to start the thing, this is my duty. Um, well, I have two things to, my most important, uh, um, comment on uh, Dr. Revere presentation or article is, shall I quote him in his words? <laughs> May I quote? Uh, this is on the iconography, quote, this also confirms that we are unable to attach the hybrid iconography found in these reliefs to a particular Buddhist tradition and even less to a specific sect or Nikai, such as that of the moon Sawastiwadin, so dear to Ajahn Piriya. Thank you. Well, you mentioned me, so I had to reply. <laughs> um, and well, I agree with you. That is a hybrid economy. But you, being a wise scholar, do not step in when my being a fool 
step in where angel fears to tread. Got it? You wisely said it's a hybrid. And it's a confusion of the, the artist. The artist, uh, this is a, it's the same sort of thing, but this is when you're using uh, Indian. Mm -hmm. But it is uh, applicable to the, what we're talking of this relief. The artist at Ajanta, first then Kanheri and later in the Kampatom, may have confused or combined some elements of narratives belonging to different oral or textual tradition and sources. So this is a wise man said, he would say that. But a fool would say, I would say, the Sanskrit version, the Divyadana, should belong to the Mula Sawasivadin. This I love. And the Mula Sawasivadin should have come first into Thailand, present day Thailand, before the Theravadin, which I already stated in the Rules of Thai art anyway. So I would say that the earlier tradition persisted when the newer tradition, the Theravadin, come along. And so they combined together, not out of confusion, but out of tradition. Thank you. So I've done my duty. Oh, Thank you. Well, we do you a tune, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you have the microphone. Yeah. Yes, I know. Uh, maybe other people have questions too. Um, am I not actually quite simple? I, I was just interested um, who can decide to strip um, this panel up? of the gold of the gold plating oh, that it has had idea. it was just um no idea quite extraordinary right because it was so nicely built in and it's when i saw it, it was, it's a few years ago it sort of looked yes. fine so I, I thought that was interesting also um i would like to know does the mother in all texts turn into a man when she's in trisa streams of heaven or just in some in the mahayana versions would she also turn into a man Okay, so uh, the, on renovation, I'm not sure who order who asked. I suppose the abode, the abode, uh, abode, yeah. the abode. Mm. and there's been some renovation going on at Watsutat and in general in many temples, especially during COVID. Uh, so that I don't know. Now uh, the thing about I haven't checked all text, uh, mm -hmm. but just... least, the Pali tradition it says she turned into a, a deva or Devada, I can't remember the exact term, which is uh, ambiguous. I mean, okay. normally Devas are always born as male. Okay. Born as male. There's no such thing as female uh, Deva. That's, uh, but there is a you know, paper reference to uh, an article that discussed this issue precisely with mm. probably many more details. Okay. So I can share that reference to you if you'd like to... Yeah, that'd be interesting. For sure, that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so okay. that was just interesting to see that sometimes uh, the art and the text may make corrections. Or maybe <laughs> we just don't know enough to say about, you know, what the, you know, the text originally meant to say. Female or, or male, yeah, because yeah. Well, it, it does go again, to teach his mother. Yeah. How you understand the language, the Pali and the. Um, the grammar, yeah, yeah, can be ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Elizabeth, would you like to? Nicola, thank you very much. It's a, a, a suitable opening on looking at the variety of texts, looking at objects, and looking at the many, many links. How I, I also wanted to say a thank you to Archer and Puria for his comment, his discussant comment on tradition, <laughs> because that's where my paper, which is, comes next, comes in. So if we, I'll go ahead and move on to my own presentation. I think it's still here on the screen. Um, we've all been introducing ourselves very briefly and our, our connections to Thailand and to, to scholarship in the region. My own go back many, many years. Um, my father was actually born in Myanmar, in Burma. He was a Baptist missionary. So my first visit to Burma was, 
way back in the, when I was living in Singapore in the 1970s. But I then went on to do my PhD on Thailand, on Northeast Thailand, and was very, very excited when I came across the scholarship of Acha Imperia. So combining those two, then over the years, I moved to SOAS, taught here for quite a number of years, and more recently, I've been focusing my study as a professor emeritus in looking within Southeast Asia. And I, I raise a hypothesis here, you may accept or not accept, we'll see. Um, in looking at Pagan and beyond and trying to what I call decode possible Mon relic traditions and their influence in really the beginnings and flourishing of Pagan. See if I can manage the screen right. In looking at relics within 9th to 13th century, Upper Mama in particular, um, we have tangible footprints. This one you see here, a photo by one of the Alpawood alumni students in Mama, Sulat Win. We have relics acquired by Pagan kings when they searched out from Sri Lanka, other places for sacred and very, very much politically significant relics. And the type that I'd like to focus on today, which is a particular group called Mokdo stupas that are considered within traditional belief to be part of the 84,000 stupas simultaneously erected during Ahsoka's redissemination. Remembering the first dissemination was by the Buddha himself, but Ahsoka's redissemination of Buddhist relics throughout nine divisions and places Kodain Kotana at the time of the solar escape following a lunar eclipse. And I cited all of that simply to, to highlight the very specific event and the event that is often cited to me within Myama in talking about these Mokdal stupas. My premise here, which I hope to draw out further, and it is still a working premise, is that the network of Motdal Pias, they developed a cumulative authority, authority of their own as a tradition uh, that brings She Arhan, the monk who is credited with institutionalizing Theravada at Pagan with Mon traditions. And I'd also argue that this is possibly independent of its doctrinal textual um, roots. If we come back to the community of 84,000 stupas, coming of course from the, the, the number coming from the sections of the Pali Canon. There are various sources, the Sanskrit, Soka, Badana, Buddhavamsa, and the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. But within the Mokto stupas, I believe these have been very much merged with what we might call local social memory, the narratives of community substance, sustenance over many, many hundreds of years. This is from one particular stupa um, that I, the history, the, the Mogun Pea, the Chauksa, recording Ahsoka's rededication of the relics. And this, if you, if you read the Burmese, comes down to it was an inscription um, erected in 1995. And I included it in particular as evidence of the ongoing patronage to these temples. Stupas, not temples. In doing this, I try to set out an argument bringing more perspectives. And you have down here, see if I can make the, oh, Nicola's right, the pointer doesn't come onto the screen, does it? Um, coming down here from the tone up to the capital of Old Pagan. Two parts that I'd like to draw out from this one is what is more usually done in setting up links between Thetone and Pagan in look debating the tangible historical links of Pagan, primarily textual ones, in looking at Mon contributions to the language, architecture, religion, all of which is controversy and continues to be de debated. It is generally accepted, although we don't have that much tangible evidence that Shen Arahan helped with the institutionalization of Theravada at Pagan. And there is a further relic tradition that I'm not including within my argument here, what I call the hair tooth relic tradition. I'll mention a bit more about them in the next slide. The second one, which I've called line B here, 
He's looking at local perceptions of the past in the present, not discounting texts, but looking at a different way of understanding the past and understanding the way that the past is relevant to the present in the sustenance of Buddhist communities throughout Upper Myanmar. This comes back to the question I raised earlier, whether Shin Arahant might have been instru instrumental um, in introducing the, the concept and the knowledge of the 84,000 stupas to Pagan. Coming back, looking briefly again at my line A, the tangible evidence. This is one photograph given to me some years ago, but that I like in showing the, the flatness of the Delta areas um, and the way they move off into the sunset. Within the, these areas, within the first millennium CE, this is a map that Stephen Murphy helped make for his exhibition, Cities and Kings at the Asian Civilizations Museum. We do have tangible evidence of early kingdoms, um, one of which would have been Bago, probably when I showed you down here earlier, um, the area around Bethane. Can you, sorry, can you try to turn my phone off? <laughs> in the outside pocket. Just turn it off. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. Okay. Sorry. Um, all right. The Mon Delta Kingdoms. Within this area, there has been some archaeology, but precious little. This is one pit that was dug in 2005, where these farmers were found within what was then a, a small degraded stupa within farm areas of three images of the Buddha. Um, you see them set out here, and these are still kept within the village. They have not been moved to a museum at the request and, and really the insistence of the farmers that found them. They, they are not Mon in style. They're not Burmese in style. They're not Pew. They're, they're quite unique. And to me, they come back to this image here of looking at the kingdoms and probably their maritime connections to Sri Lanka and India. So I just raise this here as one example of the work that could be done on trying to define a Mon culture within Lower Myanmar. The hair relic tradition that I mentioned is one that's most commonly cited, that of Thona and Uttara and the bringing at Gawampati, the sage Gawampati's request to the Buddha to visit the tone, which the Buddha then did, and leaving Sandoshin and tooth, hair, tooth relics, and through their patronage, this replication into 33 stupas. This is often debated because it's not recorded really until the 15th century inscriptions of, of Damachedi. And the most hotly debated, and it still is interestingly controversial and creates many, many angry people, is the Mon paradigm, primarily put forward by Michael Ong Thuyen, um, sadly passed away not too long ago, but the, where he thinks that the conquest of the Tone, which is accepted within Myama Chronicles, was a myth and that the Mons were seen as European, as victims of the Burmans, and the writing was not, not Mon, not that Burmese writing did not develop from Mon, but it came from Pew, that Luce's sequence of dark to light temples is incorrect, and there's nothing to do with Mon. So in short, I'm dismissing all Mon evidence at Pagan. It also in this dismisses the reality of an archeology span within Lower Myanmar. These kind of studies, in fact, very strongly contradict Ong Thuyen's evidence. This is a list of walled and moated sites documented by Usan Wen within Lower Myanmar, within the Mon areas. These are some of them that he then surveyed and I surveyed quite a number with him. Um, this is him here. And this is the Ton, the disputed capital, where climbing with him over the, the walls and moats and looking at the artifacts, there's very, very strong evidence. So that 
the contribution of Lower Miami to, to Pagan. That's one argument and it's an interesting one and I wanted to just bring it forward here. But the main thrust of my article is in looking at line B that I called it relics at Pagan and beyond. What you see here on the upper right is a map of the different monuments at Pagan and on the lower right, a relic chamber found at Thiriketia, Sri Kshetra, one of the Pew sites. All these temples and many more that are just mounds on the ground have relics, of course. And in my mind, they very much focalize veneration within the consecrated space of the, the relic enshrinement. They're unseen, so I'm not going to show you relics. They're unseen, but the places where they are kept acts to visualize the narrative in relationship to community support of place. We don't even have at Pagan, which you see here from Sri Kshetra, a pew site, um, the finding of relic chambers. The Shui Mokdo that I wanna talk about are known by their places and the communities that have sustained them and the way that they're visualized through social memory. I think there is also a further association with Shin Arahant, a, a dimension of him that is not drawn out in these earlier, the, the textual ones of did Shin Arahant bring the institutionalized Theravada at Pagan. This is one that is also a living tradition that I'll show you examples of where the associations, the Shin Arahant theme are characteristic. You always can identify in the stupa, his image, an ordination hall and a pond. So I'd like to give you a few examples here. This is one at Halin, another Pew site. Um, the site is known as Shweguji Mokdo. It dates to the time of Athoka. There's a Pew inscription found there with the sun and the moon um, that's been cited in a recent work on the Pew inscriptional corpus. And there's also later Pagan period inscriptions of 1238 and 1285 with recording donations of the, the little known kings, King Solu. As you can see, it's in a quite open and not too populated landscape of it's out, actually outside the walls of Halin, but it's resonant of the local community support because in contrast to the monuments around it, many of which have, are archeologically preserved, it has been continued to be sustained. You see that by the gold stupa and the many, the many shrines around the main stupa. And well patronized, it's one of the most popular in the area. My own acquaintance with this Mokdo tradition did not begin by looking at texts or reading about them in texts and then going and searching out because in fact, most of the scholarship, the knowledge that I have gained on them has been through colleagues, Pema colleagues, word of mouth, speaking to people. I first came across this in, in 2005 in Dawe, in Lower Miama. Um, I was in a, an ordination hall outside, a Thane outside an ordination hall, looking up and there was a portrait up on the upper part of the wall, it was getting dark. And I said, who's that? It was a figure of a man with a white beard and somebody said, oh, it's Athoka, Mokdo. I said, oh. Okay, and I just accepted it and later tried to investigate. Time moved on and in 2015 at Tamok Chweguji, a Pagan period temple uncovered by the scholar Tempawadi Uwin Mong, um, we then, he then took the time and the care to introduce me more to these temples throughout Upper Mama. And I really thank him for his help on this. And then finally, which is now hopefully to be published about the same time as our book here, um, my book called Wider Pagan, Wider Pagan, an ancient and living tradition, which is being published through ICS in Singapore, where I have very important contributions from Tapawadi Uin Mong and Uin Chine. So my investigation of Mokda is still ongoing, but one that has been informed by local scholarship and local tradition. So I'll give you some examples here. What, what have, I use or what has come to me to be able to document Athoka. Local testimonies, interviews, not interviews, but speaking, just talking with people in different temples, oral histories, and particularly Payath Mine, which are pagoda 
often written by pagoda trustees or local scholars, eminent scholars appointed by the pagoda trustees. They're often dismissed by archeologists. They're repetitive, they embroider texts, but they're believed by the local community and they have been used to help sustain stupas from, from the Pagan period, at least if not with the presumption that buried within these contain the relics of Athoka. There's many stupas around this particular one. Um, this is near Chaukse, but they don't, they're not Moto, this one is. So why this one and not that one is one part of my application of them. Many of them are then linked to Shen Arahan because it's Shen Arahan that is then credited with having introduced the Asokan tradition of the 84,000 stupas to Anurata. It's often said how he went in texts, in chronicles, how he went up and promoted Theravada. But it's also noted that it was with him that this tradition then became part of the upper Myanmar repertoire. The position of Shin Arahan went on for the reigns of several kings. Um, the leader in reciting the Purita, many, many occasions. This is one I simply mentioned where within small villages and towns you go, this one simply said, reminds us the poster on the wall of the teachings of Shin Arahan and the difference that they can make to one's future. This is another example near Mektila, um, southeast of Mandalay, where you see a circuit here. There's a nodal point at the bottom. It moves up and around. And within the full moon of Wazo, many pilgrims must complete this route whilst reciting the Patan, whilst reciting the, the conditional relations. So in order to receive enlightenment. Some of these Shin Arahantain are also Mokdo. This is another one that's east of Mandalay. Um, you see the area up here, the map on my right, you see Mandalay to the left, it's to the east, approaching over to the hills there, attributed to the 12th century Min Shinzo, who during the Pagan period, he was crippled and exiled from the court and became a benefactor helping to promote the area, later poisoned by the King Narathu when he believed him and went back to Pagan for a dinner. But it, it's one example of the, the patronage that has gone to the continuation of Shin Arahan, not within major cities, I'll show you one of a city, but within small villages across Upper Mama. This is one where we see always within the interior an image of Shin Arahan, um, with the Tripitaka preaching and promoting the sense of propagation and sustenance of the, the Sangha and the Dhamma. This one is on the east edge of Mandalay. Um, I'm talking about Shin Arahan introducing at Pagan, but what about Pagan itself? Interestingly enough, there are only a few examples of the Mok Dazedi at Pagan. They're generally already encased. You see one example here within this rebuilt stupa. And in this map that I included in my article, you can see within the numbers, it's only eight, nine, 10, and 13. So eight, nine, and 10 are in the upper part of the Pagan area, and 13 is there on the south. It's number 13, which is the most well patronized. They're known, but not a center of worship. It's really outside, which is why I called this paper relics at Pagan and wider Pagan. These, the Mot Da are part of what's a wider study by my colleague Myonian Ong, who's working on his PhD for Silpicorn, very much an archeologist and architect who is defining the different types of encased stupas within the inscribed city of Pagan, according to their architectural plan. This is one you see very here, a, a single encasement, um, which is by the river Chaukmiet City, south of Minkaba, taken by one of my students, Thang Thang Ong um, at Pagan. Within Myon Ong type, typology, 
it is not the tradition that I'm considering, but the architecture in defining the Mokdozeti as being those that have a circumnambulary corridor around the inner stupa, and only those that give evidence. I would argue that there's more criteria that actually work to sustain these. There are a few within murals. Um, this is one of the Thechamuni, the 13th century temple. Um, it was kindly provided to me by Dr. Lillian Handlin. But where we do see, and this in fact is probably one of the four eye truth relics that are found at Pagan, being worshiped by two devotees in this rarely preserved painting. At Pagan itself, again, thanks to Thang Thang Ong, the Mokdal stupas are known locally, they're labeled. This one, if you write, read the Burmese, simply says it's a Mokdal Sedi, gives its number. The gate is closed as it often is. And this one happens to be near a petrol station, so which they provide good support. You see even there's even chairs out in front. My obvious point is not to decry the restoration, but to assess and to appreciate the impact of that sustenance over many, many centuries and how it continues today, very, very much so. Particularly at Pagan now, UNESCO has pulled out and um, the sustenance is very much, and, and in some ways, interestingly so, developed locally, not necessarily to the benefit of the archeological conservation, but the living site is moving back within local communities. This is Shui Mokdo, number 194, where we always see an outer stupa, but inside, and indeed this one deserves, gets then listed by Myonot Ong, because we have a small circular ambulatory space around it. This is another one, 920, perhaps the most richly endowed, not within an inner stupa, as you see here at 194, but within a temple. The Mot Do Pears beyond Pagan, and this is me with colleagues in the evening at one of them, I think have become very much repositories of the redissemination of relics through, through local belief, but at the same time reiterate a, a deepness rooted in the landscape. These are particular places that I think then link to a network of the 84,000 globally. They form very much in that sense, both a tangible and intangible interdependent network. You see here some of the examples and the most northernmost number one up at the top, Michina um, in Kachin State, down to the south, number 24 in Dawe. So they're scattered around the country, known to other local people, but not necessarily to other communities in different parts of the country. So the, the knowledge and sustenance is local. I think in this sense, we can call them places of special meaning. This is a painting um, within Shui Yimmyo, the last one, second to the last one that I'd like to bring to you, where we have Shin, uh, recognition of Shin Arahant coming and then later patronage brought to the temple by, by Chianzita in supporting this earlier donation of relics. They're not sectarian and in this I, I drew upon a, actually it was a review, um, a review by Nicolas Revere of one of um, Archer Imperius works in trying to understand, to put things within a sectarian definition. He was looking at images of the Buddha. These are not sectarian, but in some aspects they are in that this network of Mokdal places have a special meaning that's sustained within that origin and its ritual and social function. So in that sense also, they honor Achar Imperia's being able sensitivity to drawing out Mon elements within Thailand and Myanmar and Mon traditions. This is Shui Yimno, a painting from the walls showing both the, an unsigned 20th century painting with two monks together um, with King Athoka and the Jamin or Saka in depositing Asoka's relics. The history of this Mochal Pagoda then has a later 
part to it when Shen Arha is returning to Pagan from the Shan Plateau. He passes this way, it's a small ruin stupa at that time, and finds a, a mound that he previously supported in a previous life. Um, he'd once been a bird who came in and destroyed an immense fly that was large as a peafowl and took on radiant colors. So you see that fly here. And in fact, the name of the temple, Shui Yin Miao, is Miao is longing to be back, looking towards, and the Shui Yin is the golden fly. So he's given his name and he's quite a, he's over a meter high, he's quite a prominent part of the temple platform. Shui Yin Miao also supports nearly life-size sculptures of different patron, patrons, King Athoka, um, Shin Arahan, Here's the stupa itself. So the, you look at the stupa, you wouldn't know. There's no way to know without having been introduced into the local history that this indeed is a Mokdal stupa. The same thing with the Shui Thendal, east of Chaukse, um, which is attributed to Anurata, where we see this beautifully maintained. And also we see within the, this guardian cage that you have down here on the right, there is one of the original Thane or the ordination hall stones dating back to the time of Anuracha. And it was notable to me that there, there was the interest and care to not just preserve it, but to encase it within a chrome cage. The temple again is well, well patronized. You have here on its outside, a large sculpture, 3.5 meters of Anuracha. And it's one of the most patronized for its annual ceremony, wish fulfilling ceremony where coconuts and bananas are brought. So to bring this to a con conclusion, these are just the, um, the Yuaji, the important people of the town become this line of all the patrons of the living heritage of its deposition of the 84,000 relics. My main underlying point with this is to raise the value or to raise attention to the living history as a valid source of heritage and, and looking not simply at texts, but looking at local practice over the years. When what I, what I would say, would, which I introduced at the start, is the authority of local tradition that in envisioning the unseen past, I haven't shown you relics, I haven't even shown you relic chambers, but there's a knowledge of those 80, they're, they're part of the wider community and the local perception of that. Link to Shin Arahan and not at odds, but very much what one could call an emic view of the Mon contributions to Pagan in elevating the local history um, to decode the past perception because that perception has been sustained not just today, but in the past. Um, in the present, on the ground, in the villages and towns of Upper Mama. This comes back, this is Anurata, the Shui Yim Yo. So I thank you. And I, I'd like to end with also a thanks and dedication to the late Mon scholar, Usan Win, who I noted with his study of Thuwana Bumi, but also my very, very great thanks to Achar Imperia and the editors of the book for including this study of living culture within our forthcoming volume dedicated to the scholarship of Acha Imperia. So thank you. Thank you very much. Do I cr get critiqued? <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> oh. No, no, it's okay. I no, I see. No, I see. Well, why don't you stick here? Because I'm in my crib. Yeah, no. We did with the last one. Well, may I thank uh, Professor Moore for her excellent oh. uh, paper. Um, I'm greatly honored it's included in this shift because it's uh, broadened our knowledge, not only of Burma, oh, sorry, Myanmar, mm -hmm. uh, between Bagan and, and the Mon 
countries, but also is um, applicable to Chiang Mai as well. Mm -hmm. So if criterion was the architectural of an encased stupa, mm -hmm. then we have plenty in Chiang Mai. Mm -hmm. Even though we don't have the local history to go with it, but the art or architectural history of the, of the stupa itself would of course confirm of your mm -hmm. uh, thesis. So we can use it. And of course, lo local uh, tradition can also be very well utilized in Thailand as well. Mm -hmm. So this paper doesn't only deal with uh, Myanmar, it's also deal with Thailand and we can use it thanks to you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. That's my comment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just comment, just a little comment. It's just so totally fascinating. Um, and you already answered what I was going to ask is about the caskets in each of the stupa. It has to have containers. Can you just uh, address a little bit of generic type of what do you find that they use when they ex excavated the stupa? Do they find the container of relics inside? Can you address on any kind of forms that they use in that region? Because like the legend had it says Shui Da Gong uh, has is in the shape of a, a boat of something of a boat, right? Something like that. Do they talk about it or have you found any of those in any of these encased stupas? The Shui, Shui what was the, the third? The, the Shui Da Gong container of relics, supposedly. Oh, at the Shui Da Gong. Yes. Uh -huh. But then how about in the Mon region? Do, mm. Have you seen or do they talk about specific shape of relics, relic, relic carry, right? Relic container. Do we know anything about that? Thank you, Pat. No, that's a, it's a fascinating question. No, we, I mean, the, I have heard that the relics of the, at the Shredagon are floating underneath the, the, there's the hair washing stupa and there's waters because it's in the Delta areas and that they're floating within a casket. There's a small golden casket at oh. the bottom. This was, and somebody was said to have gone there down once and seen it. However, Within Lower Mamma, the only relics I've actually seen are visiting um, meditation centers within Yangon, where you often see datu. You know, the datu yeah, can be yeah. simply small, small pellets or rice-like grains. But but the relics can also be, I've been to a number of um, reconsecration ceremonies where additional relics within, within the Mon state um, one near Chaikatha were, were reinstalled and new relics were added to the Chaikyo Pagoda in 2000. The relics at, included ones that actually depicted the, the eight different directions so that they could, they don't, aren't necessarily just, you know, rice type relics, but they're usually gold or silver reliquary objects that are then added to the tabana, to the relic chamber. So that I think that strictly speaking, the relics are small, small little pieces, but in fact speaking, they also include many, many votive tablets that were interred as relics. Um, and some that like, for example, found in Lower Miama in, in Dawe, where the, they're inscribed on the back. So that those inscriptions in a sense, then they become text relics so that they do, they do reach out to the different types of relics defined by the Buddha. So yes, it's an interesting, so, something I'd like to look at more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anybody else has questions? Elizabeth, could I ask whether the ceremonies associated with them are going on today? <laughs> yes, there any interruption? in the cycle of, of ceremonies. I can see signs of very large ones there. Are those still permitted under the, the, the current <laughs> emergency conditions? Um, they're held locally and held informally. There's, there's no foreign visitors. 
and there's usually not any official um, presence at them. But yes, it was my comment that I think under the present conditions where not only UNESCO, but, but all international projects that had been building up at Pagan um, have, are suspended until the, something is worked out in the country. Um, but that, that local care has taken over. So that in many cases, I was just sent the other day a, a picture of a, a, new, a new stupa that previously was a mound. And it has now become the most popular place in all of Pagan. Um, that a woman had a dream that a naga gave birth to a young baby boy. And so there's a, a large image of a naga here and his, the whole shrine filled with offerings, including candy and stuff for the, for the young child. So that over time, well, it's, sadly, it's also bringing detention and other very difficult things. Um, it, it seems to have built up a local sustenance, less so the large state ceremonies, which are only attended by those in charge right now. So yes, there's a, a, a gap between different practices. Thank you. Sorry, oh, once more, excuse me. <laughs> well, I haven't um, mentioned uh, your, put can I quote you again, sorry. Yes. Yes, uh, quote, uh, the Mokta Stupa are certainly not sectarian. Mm -hmm. As a John Piria advocate. Uh, okay. Uh, it is certainly sectarian, it's a terror in Buddhism oh, I... by excellence. Sorry. Mm, yeah. Sorry. No, that I I that was somewhat of a hedge mm. because um by introducing that I meant to say, well, maybe they are. They're, they're not they're not Mahayana or Theravada, they're their own locally evolved sect, but how to fully define them. So yes, I, I, I perhaps I shouldn't have put that in the article. Well, the, the thing is published yet until August, mm -hmm. until next month, so you can have a change. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, so that they are sectarian. Okay, Nicola, will you accept more? Okay. Do you accept that? Yes, in a way, maybe they bring out an, a new definition of what sectarian is. Okay. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you. Yes. Well, yes. all right. Well, critique. Thanks. Okay. I, I was thinking of a follow-up. Uh, a follow-up on the present situation. One of our alumna in Bagan tells me she's... Um, trying to survive they haven't had electricity for three weeks this seems to be uh seems to rule out a great deal of what would normally be taking place in myanmar where they love festivals and they love parades in the streets and so on is that um is that your impression well yes it's it's a problem because the the electricity cuts are not announced and so one doesn't know exactly when the electricity will be cut or when it will come back up. And, and the local currency has, I think, worth half of what it used to be worth. So yes, the economic stress is slowly, but, but the festivals and the ceremonies do continue. Not with maybe less loud, you know, less electricity, but yes, no, it's, it's an extreme, and I think a growing economic hardship that's being imposed. So let's hope for soon negotiation and betterment of the situation. Thank you. No, no I think there was one, one thing missing is uh, you cannot uh, assemble many people together. So that, that's also, you know, uh, people don't want to go because uh, if pe there are more people, they, they get scared. That, that's one of the reasons it's, uh, finan besides financial and other issues, there's anything that I thought I would say that mm. about the people gathering, they're rather uh, nervous. Thank you.
Yes, so I, I'm I'm not didn't I from Myanmar, yeah, but uh, been here so long. <laughs> thank, thank you. you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Should we move on to the next paper, Peter? Oops, I think then we move on to Peter, who's going to give the next paper. My name is uh, Peter Shark. I've been uh, in SOAS for about 20 years. Um, where I'm sorry I couldn't get earlier. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the problem with blended learning programs is that you're either here or you're there. So you're racing between the two. Fortunately, I live quite close. So I've managed to do that. But uh, uh, at this time of year, unfortunately, it means very few students on campus. So all this wonderful, uh, all these wonderful presentations which are being recorded. So we'll put them up and we'll draw our students' attentions to them. Um, uh, uh, will will not be lost. And uh, I gather we've got a couple of people coming in internationally as well, although we can't take questions from them. Uh, my uh, great experience of Achan Pilia was uh, when I was privileged to edit the English version of his book, which was so long ago that he's forgotten. <laughs> But we had a we had a long exchange of views on various identifications of of Buddhist of, of Buddhas in the uh, in 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 Piria's book, which was a very very important one at the time. I mean, honestly, his work has been has, has been the great illumination of Thai Buddhism, Buddhist history. He, along with uh, Hiram Woodward, um, are. are the two great, I think, uh, I think uh, Piria was Harvard and uh, Woody was um, yeah. Yale. <laughs> so we got the two together uh, in looking at Thai art um, and the collection in uh, uh, that that Woody was uh, curator of so long in in. Uh, uh, in the United States was one of the main major collections, the Griswold collection, and his work on that uh, really was a massive contribution to uh, academic uh, work on, on Thai art, followed, of course, by Piria's works. So thank you for, uh, to Nicola for organizing a splendid book uh, in honor of uh, Piria's um, contribution to the field. I can't believe what it, the literature says about his age, um, because he looks at least 20 years younger than me. But um, there we are. It's a, it's a point in life when the community acknowledges the great contribution of an exceptional mind in the subject. My small contribution um, is on this figure. Um, I've written uh, about the Naga Buddha in Cambodia, which is pretty ubiquitous. Um, and I think we, we generally get it wrong. It's normally said to be a Muchalinda Buddha because it refers back to the story uh, in either the second or, or sixth week of the Buddha's life after, after his enlightenment, his full awakening, when he was meditating beside the Muchalinda Buddha and a serpent which lived in the lake, who understood the Buddha, understood meditation, and knew also had a good weather forecast because he saw um, uh, an unseasonal storm approaching. So uh, he came out of the lake, wrapped himself around the Buddha who was gone in uh, Samadhi. He, he, he was in meditation in his new state learning to live with the knowledge and the, uh, uh, of his new be being, the, the status that he'd achieved. It was still new to him. He was, he, was, he was experiencing it. And not much of him was left in the samsara beside the river. So the snake just wrapped around him, put his hood over the top, and protected him till the, till the storm had passed. So that's the Mujilid story, and that's very much current in Cambodia today, in Thailand today, and in Myanmar today. So the, the main Theravada communities immediately see Muchalinda when they see uh, a Buddha seat on Naga. However, these Nagas 
were created in the Mahayana period of Angkor. So the, the period of the apogee when, uh, when Buddhism uh, took over as the lead religion uh, from Shaivism in Angkor. And um, so what was the place of Mujalinda in the Mahayana? Well, almost non-existent. The Mahayana was into philosophy, was into a cos defining a cosmos of many Buddhas, and, uh, and, 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 and was concerned with ways of interacting with them and achieving uh, uh, an equal status with them. So the idea of changing yourself to achieve the other much higher state and not having to go through samsara was common to all Buddhism, and it was certainly there in the Mahayana in Angkor. So why uh, does this uh, regal Buddha sit on a, a throne like Naga? Um, Not, oh, here we go. Here we go. So it was a major icon. It was ubiquitous. I've illustrated here uh, the wraparound Muchalinda, which is a panel from Gandhara, which is in the Victorian Albert Museum in London and quite a well-known one. Um, the... Uh, what, what was the significance of relating the Buddha to serpents? Well, it was, it's something very profound in humanity. Uh, uh, apparently man venerated trees because of their force, their height, their power, and their importance in life. And serpents, because serpents could live under the earth and serpents like uh, dragons in Chinese mythology could also fly, travel through the sky and reach the higher realms of the universe. They were important uh, for producing rain. So if you saw a Naga cloud, it was one of those big dark ones. We had one in London this morning or this afternoon. Um, and those were highly prized and any king needed a piece of territory with a naga known to be in it so that it would be fertile for the people. So that was the, the linkage between the Buddhas. And I'm, I'm suggesting here that, um, that the, 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 there was a Buddhist reassurance to local cults of trees and Buddhas in the, in the ancient world that gave their gods uh, and beliefs, uh, showed that they would be respected in the new um, philosophy and religion which was entering, um, because the Buddhists were active in particularly Eastern and Northeastern India and up in Bihar in settling hunter-gatherer communities into more sophisticated agricultural uh, sites where they helped them with uh, dams, rivers, river uh, water management, anything which was technology, the monks had it. So they helped the people settle, and and the and that was, I think, why the Buddhists wanted to say, please join the Buddhist community, please come and listen, please help our monks who are not allowed to work in the fields like you are, um, but come with all your own baggage. It doesn't matter. Come into the Buddhist under the Buddhist parasol because it's an, an open and uh, um, inviting um, community, and we will help you. So there are lots uh, in the early Indian sites, some of parts of which are in um, the British Museum nearby. Um, here we are, have Buddhas seated on Nagas. Uh, this is Amaravati, uh, and on the, the, the stupa dome, there is a, there is a Buddha here um, in Abhaya Mudra, I think, um, seated on, on a double uh, hooded uh, cobra, if that's what the, the snake is, being venerated by people um, and various other ones. 
So, and also in many of the reliefs in these early sites, there are Naga Rajas and um, Naga Queens. So that the, the underworld of uh, the Nagas was deeply respected by the Buddhists. The, these were ancient beliefs and, and, and they, were, they appear very often alongside the, um, the Buddha in the reliefs in, in Eastern India, in, in Andhra. So I've um, made a small contribution to this Festschrift for Achan Piriya by suggesting that the Khmer Buddha seated on the Naga may in fact bring the Khmer Buddhist community closer to that of Japan, Korea, China. Um, because uh, Cam uh, Cambodian art history and archaeology is difficult because uh, in the tropical climate, lots of things were lost. There aren't many texts that have survived. Uh, if, 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 some, if writing was not inscribed on a temple wall, it's probably lost. However, it was a highly literate society. Uh, the inscriptions in, in the period of Jaivam and the seventh in the 12th century, there is 1181 to about 1218, a long reign, returned to Sanskrit. And it was an excellent Sanskrit. We have some Sanskritists here. Um, the Pimianakas inscription written by one of the queens of Jayavarman is said to be the most perfect in terms of the way it is written and in the grammar with which it is written. Um, and that queen, Indra Devi, was the head of um, uh, a girl's, uh, an, an orphan's, orphan girl's school. So she took in the orphans who lost their parents and she taught them everything, including Sanskrit. So that gives you an idea that this was a literate society, but we've lost, unfortunately, most of the literature. We've also lost quite a lot of the uh, iconography because uh, it's been destroyed. It suffered through the periods of history and it was a long time ago. And it, Angkor was built in the middle of a large tropical jungle. Um, there are portraits which are of interest and two queens um, and uh, the king himself who appear, which we think the, 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 the veridical, the life portraits, we think were also erected in the Bayon State Temple. This is a huge temple um, constructed, construction began at the beginning of the reign in the 1180s and continued through presumably to the death of the king. That was traditionally, it wasn't finished, no temple ever was, um, but the building would continue until the king died. And then they would all work on the funeral, the huge funeral for the, the royal funeral when he would receive his posthumous title. The king would depart and, and, and begin his duty to protect the state in the next life, wherever that was. It could be with Vishnu for Surivaman II, or with uh, Jayavarman, he went to the Buddhas somewhere. His posthumous title says that. Um, and, and the temple would therefore be left unfinished. And the next king would come and order new, the royal uh, carvers and architects to build something else. So uh, we have portraits of the king and his queens and princesses which look like veridical photograph portraits. And we have others where they have Amitabha figurines on their heads. So these are distinctive. And a figurine on the head would probably suggest rebirth in Sukhavati. Sukhavati is the Western paradise of Amitabha. Now, Avalokiteshvara is a leading religious figure in Angkor at this period, really everywhere. And Amitabha is only mentioned in 10th century inscriptions. After that, um, the name doesn't appear again, which is strange, but every the icon is there, no name, silent. Um, 
it seems plausible to me that uh, the Jinnah Amitabha of the Western Paradise may well be represented in this icon, which is 3.6 meters high and which came from the central sanctuary of the Bayon. And there we have a Buddha seated in meditation in Amitabha's position on, and on the coils of Anaga. So um, the, no inscription uh, as to the identity of the Buddha. Um, and the normal thing uh, today is to refer back to the Muchalinda story, which is current in Buddhism in, in, in the country today. Um, Here are some of the icons. The, in the center is the king, that's a portrait with his head pulled into a ball at the back of his head. Um, it's a very distinctive uh, face. He was a powerful man who was a soldier. He campaigned in Champa for um, at least a decade before taking the throne, driving indeed a Cham expeditionary force out of Angkor. And this is his first wife. Uh, who is Jaya Raja Devi, who died young. Uh, she was born into a Brahmin's family, like her sister. Um, that's why they had such excellent Sanskrit. And, uh, and she was ill. She missed her husband who was absent in, in Cambodia and in hiding, and she died young. The portraits, the only portraits we have of her are on have, have the Amitabha figurine in the hair. So the suggestion is that she has become part of Pragna Paramita, the goddess of wisdom, in a Buddhist location in the afterlife. This is the, this is the full portrait of the king now in the National Museum. So there we have a close up. It's an individual face. This is very unusual, rather drawn, the wide mouth, a drawn face, um, uh, a, a powerful, quiet, and uh, um, intense woman, which is what the, ins the inscriptions say about her. Now, portraits began. Portraits were uh, new. They, they, the Khmers in, seemed to have invented them. Um, and before uh, Jayavarman and his queens, we have a portrait of Suryavarman II. This is on the Southern Wall Gallery of Angkor Wat. And this is the king with, uh, again, a quite distinctive face. The photograph's not that clear. Um, talking to his ministers, and there are inscriptions saying that uh, one, one of them is the minister for defects. This was a, this was a brilliant uh, building society, building the largest temple on earth in Angkor Wat for this uh, very difficult king who was spent his time, he only built one temple, and he spent his time on military campaigns throughout the region, expanding the empire. Uh, we, we know it's him because of all these, uh, uh, the 14 parasols above him. And just in this top corner, there is an inscription which says, in the, uh, the Kali Yuga is the southern face, that's the present face, um, the, the present day uh, gallery of Angkor Wat. Um, there's the inscription. It says, His Majesty, Supreme sacred, sacred Feet Lord, so his head is close to the sacred feet of the deity, he is the closest. So when he, when, when he bows to the God or the Buddha, he is the closest representing all his people. Parama Vishnu Loka, gone to Vishnu's world, was pleased beyond Mount Shivapada to dispatch his troops. He was a military king. And this was uh, on the way to Hanoi, so one of those expeditions. So he went up to Wat Pu uh, on the Thai border to, um, 
uh, to send off the troops. And there's a large military parade which follows this picture here. And one of the one of the people on an elephant is the king again. So this is a portrait. What about this is the Jayavarman portrait I spoke about before. And this is a head which suddenly jumped out of me in, in, in a volume that I was reading on Angkor. And I thought, I know those features. This is the same face. And, but there are differences and the differences are all up here. That there is a Buddha style curls done in the Khmer way in the, in the hair, very formalized, not at all like the straight shortcut hair on, on one side. And behind it, um, the ascetic hair of a bodhisattva is covered by lotus buds. That's a standard um, uh, courtly religious uh, garb in the culture. And in front of it, there is a figure. And by looking at the bottom of this figure here, we can see that it's in meditation mudra. This is presumably Amitabha again, who's been removed. Now it was probably removed in the uh, when the Theravada moved in from Thailand and the Mahayana and the kingdom gradually collapsed. Um, uh, and uh, appropriate heads were, were were adapted to appropriate usages. Now here is the the French record. This is July 1950 in in the Tep Pranam temple, which is a Theravada uh, shrine, which is still very important uh, today. Um, this was one of many heads which were found in the pedestal. So if broken parts of sacred statues would be embedded under um, new icons that were built, it, it, it's an accumulation of sanctity in, into the new icon, because you know that underneath that are all these uh, pieces of, of, of broken, but still important sacred remains. And there are uh, some of the many heads found uh, reburied in a way, uh, ritually reburied and preserved and conserved in the pedestal under the, the new icon. Now, Olivier Cunin, who, as I said, knows almost every stone in Angkor, has lived there for the last 20 years and is quite an extraordinary um, encyclopedia of everything in this period. His PhD was on uh, uh, Jai Varman's period. He looked at this Buddha, which was found in Angkor Wat, the, in the Hall of a Thousand Buddhas. <clears throat> when the Theravada arrived in the 16th century, the Khmers came back, pushed the Thais out, because the Thais had come in from Ayutthaya, and they dedicated Angkor Wat to Buddhism. So they put Buddhas at the top, and they built a hall of Buddhas. Any, any icons that were found were installed in the hall of a thousand Buddhas. And what Olivier did was looking at this icon in the conservatory in Siem Reap, he noticed that this body on this square base was very, very close to the body of the king, but not the face and not the head. And as you can see, the head is not a very good fit. So he took this eye, this eye, this head, and tried it on this face with high-tech photography, not removing a head and putting a new one on, but measuring all the points with uh, in in minute detail, and concluded it was a perfect fit. So he he did uh, a slide. Uh, he he gave a talk, a lecture to the Royal University and ask the Apsara authority to please put the right head back onto the icon. Nothing has happened yet. It's not an easy matter, removing the head of a Buddha and replacing it with another. But it, the case is there, nothing yet has been done, but it seems to be a perfect fit. Now, Olivier's then chased up where all these icons were found in different sites in Angkor, all the pieces, here's the head, Tapram had a few. Um, the, these are the queens. Um, and Tepranam is there. 
And that's his record of where the pieces are in the conservation, where they were found, going through the records. The French records are very good. And here are two more. So there is the one I've already showed you where the, the, the head, he's put the head back onto this one. Here's another one, which is slightly larger, with another uh, identifiable Amitabha knee and hand posture on the top. Um, so my surmise is that we are looking at a posthumous portrait of the king. And the, um, the dedication to Avalokiteshvara is unquestioned in this period. The, the whole Western gallery of Angkor Wat, uh, Angkor, uh, Bhante Chamar Temple, which is the second largest in uh, the largest actual complex in Cambodia, is near the Thai border and it's being restored now happily. Uh, uh, the, Several of the walls are going up. Eight more than life-size pictures of Avalokiteshvara are facing Sukhavati in the West. This is a major statement about the power. And it, it's the Karanda Vyuha Sutra, which in some phases places Av Avalokiteshvara even higher than, than anyone else. The whole cosmos of Buddhas is in Avalokiteshvara's body. And he visits the Buddha locations all around the cosmos. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Mahayana notion of a, a massive cosmos and a huge role for uh, Avalokiteshvara in it. Now, the portrait of the queen, um, why is she kneeling? Well, I think she has not become the goddess of supreme wisdom. She has not become Prajna Paramita but she seems to have gone into the realm where, which, is, which contains Pragna Paramita. Um, now, the, uh, the uh, archaeologists uh, have, have been scanning the Bayon to see where these icons could have been, looking at every mark on the, on, on the floor, on the stone where they could have worn. And Christophe Potier from the FAO um, wrote a very good paper called The King in His Temple, uh, where he was finding the most likely places. Oh, that was a, a wrong touch on the wrong thing, wasn't it? Press? Just press that button there, yeah. That one? The one to the right. Oh, that. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, but, okay. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, Olivier did an, a minute study of exactly, of all the sanctuaries in the central sanctuary of the Bayon and reached the conclusion that it was this one at the bottom, number 15, where the, uh, the portraits would have been installed. This was a matter of measuring uh, post holes, um, uh, uh, worn spaces on the ground and so on. So not right next, the Buddha was, the Naga Buddha is, is here. Potier thought it was there, next to two inscriptions. And Olivier has concluded that no, they were down here in, in 50. Um, this is what Michel Gauvin tells me about the Amitabha cult in East Asia to try and compare the situation in Angkor. He says it's based on these three scriptures, basically. Um, fundamental to the spread of the faith and the possibility of rebirth in Amitabha's pure land um, and to the, to the late emergence in Japan of a pure land school around 1200 CE. Now, oddly, that's exactly the time that the Bayon was built and constructed and the Naga Buddha, the 3.6 meter Buddha, was installed in it at the same period that this Pure Land School was establishing itself in Japan. Now, Elizabeth's been talking about how Buddhist communities always network. They always communicate with each other. Well, they do internationally too. So it's quite feasible that uh, this great kingdom in, uh, in, in Angkor was in touch with Japan. Um, the, 
non-exclusive devotion to Am Amitabha was already diffused in Japan and became particularly influ influential among aristocrats around the 10th century. In Angkor, an alternative route to rebirth in Sukhavati was via the Baishajya Guru Sutra. The sanctuary of Baishajya Guru, that's the medical Buddha. This king built 102 hospitals, the first national health system in the world in, in, uh, in 1865. Um, and the medical Buddha was present in all of them, a triad of, of uh, I visited hospitals in Northeast Thailand with uh, Nicola some years ago, and they, the, the, museum, the, the, the museums out there have, are full of images of the medical Buddha and two bodhisattvas that were helping him in the hospitals. In, uh, in the Bayon, this is where this is where the, uh, the Naga Buddha is. This is where the king was. And that is the special sanctuary to the medical Buddha that was so important in this uh, culture. So it, you could, uh, having, having learned how to cure yourself through uh, uh, medical rituals with Baishajya Guru, um, you, it, you could also step to Sukhavati, that having been made whole, the objective was to go to the Western paradise. And this is Gregory Chopin saying the master of medical, this is his, his PhD, the master of medical remedies text conveys a deep affiliation with the cult of Amitabha and the Sukhavati Buddha field, Buddha Kshetra. So it looks like, although we didn't know it, we've been looking for a long time at a Buddha seated on Naga throne in Angkor who was probably Amitabha, venerated by a king who was seeing himself going there in his next life and his two queens. So much, I, I, would, like to, I would like to tell the Japanese that have been working for about 30 years now on stabilizing the Bayon, that inside here was a Pure Lands cult of Amitabha, much like you have back home in Japan. And I'm sure they would be delighted to learn it. Okay, thank you. Questions? Achan is going to. Comment, comment. Oh, comment. Thank you, please. Discussion. Discussion. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you much, Dr. Sharok, for um, introducing new interpretation into the Bayon. Well, of course, as you know, I'm a great fan of Amitabha, and I warmly welcome you <laughs> into the fold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, um, explanation has to be more precise on on the Naga aspect. Mm. That is still uh, difficult. Um, I agree with the kneeling posture. Why should the goddess Prachaya Paramita be kneeling? I think that would go on your way. That would support your argument because uh, the 22, uh, 22 hand or something, Prachaya is more correctly. Chi, you know, there's small picarine with multiple hands. That would be the goddess. Hmm. But why should this lady kneeling uh, with, with the metapa on her, in front of her shinyong, I would agree that it's, it does support you. Um, also, I would like to add that we do have an uh, image of the Buddha seated uh, on a lotus, a very big one, in a Lokburi Museum that I define as a metapa. Oh. And on a, on a stalk, mm. on, on above which is the lotus flower, and he's sitting on it. It's a very big image. So that would seem to support your idea on, on the new excavation at Beng Melia. Again, the, you have to fit in the Naga somehow. So I would leave the Naga for you to do more work. Mm -hmm. Yes, to explain it, it's a traditional explanation. 
uh, I think it's not sufficient uh, for most people. Uh, it has to be, it's, in fact, it's a Daga in the command um, tradition. Um, it has to have some uh, texture. The best thing is the best thing to do is to have textual support for the Naga. Somehow uh, that is still a problematical. <laughs> but thank you very much for your very bright and brilliant idea uh, to further our knowledge. And thank you for being um, brave to do it, and especially in this book. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately, there is uh, very little reference to Naga in the in the text. No Naga text. Naga believe, belongs to the local culture and local belief. There are lots of stories about uh, uh, the Bayon. Uh, 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 there was a Naga underneath the Bayon first, and they had to do long ceremonies to propitiate the Naga to say, "Sorry, we're going to put this huge temple on your head." Um, but these are these are uh, from the middle period. The, the, and, and, and they are written, but they're not from the not from the Angkor period. What are you saying now? It's a part of your idea. Yes, but but, but I guess we have a microphone. Right. Pia. Uh, uh, yes, yes. No, I'll come because we actually we have a territory to go. Um, yes. I guess. Yes, we're, it's then that specific, yes, very much the Naga is known throughout Southeast Asia in terms of, of construction. You have to be very careful because he's moving his head all the time. I, I think it's fascinating, Peter, but I, I just, yes, it's, it's drawing on what Akhtar Imperia says, just, yeah, looking more at the, the connection to the Naga and, and Amitabha, but maybe you don't have. We don't know. We have we have one more paper. Yes, yes. I think we should begin immediately. Yes. Okay. Um, but I thank you. Peter has he he shares with you a braveness. So uh, and in looking out and making new hypotheses that mm. that I think uncover new things. So thank you. I think in uh, in Japan, uh, Amitabha is on a peacock. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to keep my uh, mask on. Um, first of all, uh, we always introduce ourselves, right? Uh, oh, uh, my name is Pat Jirapurat. I'm a faculty from California State University, Sacramento in the U.S. And uh, before I, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, I was privileged to be the first, uh, first students a year that Priya came back to teach in Thailand. So he was not only just my, uh, my advisor, but he was my thesis advisor and wrote letters of recommendation for me to go study abroad. So I ended up uh, with my PhD at Cornell University. And the reason that I went to uh, the US was because Prince Supat, my uncle, wanted me to go study like Puria to go to study in the US instead of in France. So because of him, I have followed his footsteps closely to these days. And even to these days, I still read every single book that come out and use that religiously. Thank you. So since I'm the last person and there's supposed to be an event at five, right? And it's already uh, five minutes to five. I'm going to, uh, pardon me, 10 minutes, okay. So my story is about um, the earth goddess. So what happened was that three years ago, I was uh, had to be in quarantine at the Royal Hotel in Bangkok and it was 15 nights. So right in front of my windows, guess what? So I'm talking about uh, Mayor Pratorani or the, uh, the, the Thai name is Mayor Pratorani, okay? So, this is the shrine. Every single day, I saw people coming in from early in the morning until the evening. Uh, and they would bring very beautiful cloth that they put on the image. So you can see here, this is an old picture of when the image was built 
it was um, uh, dedicated, uh, the, the shrine was built by uh, the, the head queen of um, King Jualongkorn, who ruled Bangkok until 1910. The shrine was uh, kind of a uh, um, merit making for his queen when she turned uh, her 50th birthday. So this is a sculpture that the earth goddess wringing hair and the hair has water coming out. And this water actually was the first clean water from water pipe. Instead of in the olden days, people would go to the canal, you know, drink whatever they find. This is what, what makes special because King Rama V traveled to Europe the second trip in 1907-8, came back and realized how important it is for people to have good source of water. So this was built every day. I saw people changing clothing and then people come and get water and put it on their head, blessing themselves. And then many times you will see the color change. People would uh, choose um, the color that is either uh, the color of their birthday or is it uh, means that uh, if you are born on Monday, it's yellow, Tuesday is the pink, you know, like that, Wednesday is green, or it's the color that you like. So that became the color that they changed here throughout the day. You can see, I kept taking pictures of every <laughs> single day. Or people would come and donate the little figurines of the earth goddess like that. So there's gazillions of them around the shrine. Uh, and then, uh, um, uh, so this is the form that was created for the first one, okay, in this form. So I was curious after that, I became very obsessed with uh, the earth goddess. So I said, I have to study Bhumi Devi. So I went to temples and started seeing that. Well, in uh, uh, traditionally, in Thai art, uh, if you go to mural, see mural painting, you will see that the image will be placed with standing, wringing her hair, okay? And this is the Buddha meditating at the moment before he attained enlightenment. He reached out his hand, calling the earth goddess. The earth goddess came up, wrings her hair, and flood out all this Mara, you know, the God of death. Okay, so you can see here. Here is a, a either standing or seated. This is one, it's beautiful. You have to go see it in, um, in Bangkok, okay. Um, and then, so then I started looking into sources. I look into Indian art, like this is the one from Palasena period. I realized that in India, the earth goddess doesn't have anything to do with wringing hair and flooding uh, 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 Mara, uh, but she just uh, appear, you know, at the throne, very minor, minor role. So what is going on in Thailand? What I did was that I then found out that, um, so, um, uh, I'm panicked because I don't have time. So uh, uh, in late 19th century, you will see that she's gonna change the role into killing the Mara's troop. And here uh, I'm going to skip, okay? This is the beautiful temple. Uh, note that if you want to see a good example, go to what Puttapati in Wimbledon. This is on the wall of that temple, very nice beautiful uh, Bhumi Devi there. All right, let's skip. So there's different forms and shapes. And then we, when did, so I start, when did we start seeing Bhumi Devi appearing, like wringing her hair? So the earliest one is from Ayutthaya period, okay? So see this little bronze at the National Museum and you can see she's standing up and wringing her hair. So what is going on? Is there any textual sources that we can find? Well, the Indian use very different source. It's called, uh, 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 it's a uh, Patama Sambodhi uh, in, in Indian text, but in Thai, Laos and Cambodia, it is a very common vernacular, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, canonical text, a post-canonical text that is quite uh, popular in this whole region. But in Thailand, when King Rama uh, the first 
became king, he actually has um, the um, uh, Supreme Patriot uh, translated, compiled and translated it into Thai version called Pratom Sampot. Okay, so this 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 short version is called uh, that. Then again, in um, uh, we have another version called a short or a bridge version that was um, uh, uh, done. And then the second one, the longer version that was done by Grumpa uh, Puruman uh, Shit Chinorot. Okay, uh, in around uh, 19, uh, 1840s. Okay, that's he did. So um, then because of that, um, we know that there's this textual sources that cite precisely, if you are interested, read the text, uh, the, the article, it cites precisely of what exactly happened when the earth goddess came, she wrings her hair. So that became the source of this kind of iconographic representation of the Buddha in Thai, Thai art in the 18th century bronze that you can see from 1518. And as you know that in reality, the earth goddess is a, 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 a Hindu goddess who is the uh, consort of Vishnu, right? Okay, so because of that, uh, she's actually is a Hindu goddess and main consort of Vishnu. And then later on, you can see that, uh, so this is from the Brahmin temple, you will see uh, uh, Lakshmi and Bhumi Devi um, next to Vishnu. So textual sources, as I said, the short version and the long version. And then by the time King Rama III reigned, King Rama III decided that to have bronze casting of 26 new type of Buddha images. Then he had this kind of uh, um, small, images made, they are only 10 centimeter, and the king had it uh, um, uh, made, and then this became very popular, uh, small bronze pieces. If you want to see examples, go to the National Museum. This is one of those that has uh, the earth goddess wringing her hair. This is Rama, the third brain, 19th century. So then um, in search of that, it's still not the same as the one that we see at Utokatan, the shrine. So where does that come from? This is the only one of seated figure wringing the hair. We don't know where the original placement of this, this image is, but we know for sure that the queen actually, after she decided to do this as an offering of water for people, it was Prince Narit who designed the image. So I don't know if this, this piece was in Wangna or not, Ajahn, but it was actually um, maybe used as an example of the one that would be uh, at uh, Utokatan. So um, Prince uh, Narit was the one who, uh, who designed it. There's um, details of how, uh, uh, who who cast it, who casted the image, okay, and then uh, put it on the shrine with the structure that he also designed, Prince Narit designed, and you can see that there's gatha, so there's ch chanting that you can go there and you do your chanting. It's is translated into Thai, also so Pali and Thai. If you are interested in that, look at the appendix. Uh, Trent Walker uh, helped translate that for me. So then I went to different temples. So you can see that the earth god goddess was inside of the temple before, right? On the wall paintings. But now these days from 1950 on, you will see that she became an image of her own right, not even inside of the temple anymore. But outside people come, the first place that they would go venerate is the earth goddess. This is a very beautiful one at what uh, Prishaya, uh, the, with, with the gatha also. And then uh, what Pantai uh, Singh in Samut Pragran, you can see uh, different places they uh, pose a little bit differently. So, you know, the hair twitching on the left or on the right, 
but there are also standing ones. But this one is really amazing. This is the one in Chantaburi. You can, you want to see the scale is 18 meters. This is the biggest one in the world. And I saw a documentary when they were um, doing the blessing, the opening ceremony of this place. They didn't use monks to do the chanting. They use only nuns. They were dressing in white, you know? So I, that makes me feel even more fascinated with all the whole thing. So she, instead of becoming just part of the enlightenment, she became a goddess herself, the, the image that the Thai worship now in particular, you will see that this is the one in the 15th century. I'm showing from the, the different materials. This is actually very beautiful. Um, uh, wooden wood carving, but we don't know what happened to the image on top because the monks say that it floats in the river and show up by uh, where this temple is at Wat Peru. The other side of it is Buddha footprints again. Is Buddha footprint really beautiful? So um, we found this one at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco that came out from Doris Duke Charitable uh, Foundation. It is the biggest size. Uh, uh, it's a hundred, you know, uh, um, a, a hundred uh, by four hundred centimeter. It's a painting on panel. Um, this is the one, the detail of that. Sorry that I don't have time to explain. We find uh, her appear on Buddhist manuscript. This is the one in the British Museum that uh, has dated. And then we found her on uh, Papa Boat here also, Papa Wei, uh, in northeastern region of Thailand. But being Thai, you know that Thai likes to wear amulets and all sorts of things. That's the, the way things go now. So she actually became most popularly worn by people. You can go to Amulet's Market and buy uh, the one that I say that has the most beautiful seated one at Wat Chompu Wei. This is the one suit after. I was trying to go to that temple and ask to see if I can find the old one. And the uh, Amulet um, seller said to me, don't touch, you can see that but you cannot touch, this is most difficult. So at this temple now, they don't have this form. They have you uh, buy this type instead. So this one I got to buy amulets with uh, enlightenment. Then Thai being Thai, everything has to change. We worship uh, spirits, right? So when you go now, this is surprisingly enough, not a temple, but it is part of a restaurant. <laughs> so you can see from Naga to Bumi Devi, you know, the earth goddess, to the spirit houses. This is very Thai. So we, we combine things. So she became a new, uh, performing a new role. So she, her role is her own role as the person who brings good luck. Uh, and uh, uh, sent away uh, bad luck from people, help people like recovering from uh, 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 pain and sufferings. And of course, you see her on tattoos. And uh, uh, this, uh, this, the Metropolitan Waterworks Authority also has her on it. As you know, King Rama V was the one who established uh, the Department of uh, Waterworks uh, in his, towards the end of his reign. Uh, it was open in Rama VI reign. But uh, so that became the image, uh, the logo of the Waterworks Authority. And even the uh, Democratic Party, uh, you can see that it is on the Democratic Party uh, logo. Uh, so the, um, what uh, I like to stress is that she gradually has transformed from a Hindu Buddhist goddess into a new role, a powerful spirit in Thai animism. Thank you very much. Well, thank you much, Pat. And uh, <laughs> Pat, well, since I'm yours, uh, <laughs> well, whatever it is, uh, what are you, I was your, um, this is oh, yeah, supervisor, sorry. 
Yeah, advisor, sorry, advisor. Uh, I can, I have the right to ask you. Uh, what is missing is, how come has a fountain? How come has a fountain? Uh, from your window, you see a fountain, and I take her as a fountain. Mm -hmm. How come has a fountain become uh, a goddess? Uh, there must be a, from from fountain to goddess. There must be a link. Of course, it's written behind, underneath the the fountain, yes. linking it to the to the enlightenment. Yes, uh, but that that doesn't kind of explain why why she become a goddess uh, for prosperity. And because I, I, it flush <laughs> away all the bad. Um, Bad luck and fortune like that. Yes, but, but yeah. how could she flush? Oh, okay, okay, yes. okay. Yes. Yes, evil. Yeah. So people didn't take her as being the uh, beneficence of, of water at all. No. Its original point is completely forgotten. Yes, exactly. That's why I said it's from ta ta Hindu God into mm. Buddha, uh, part of the Buddhist uh, mm -hmm. story. And then become Thai, 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 not animistic, but Thai, Thai talismatic, talismatic oh, yeah. practice. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for a very nice presentation. <laughs> thank you. Could I, could I ask one brief question? Thank you. Fascinating paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, no, no, you did well. On, in one part where the very, the largest one, you said that it was consecrated by nuns, which was interesting, yeah. but but in all the other examples you show, it's not particularly gender preferred. It's not women only that, it's everybody. It's for everybody. Okay. But, but I think that the turning point was around maybe 30 years ago when uh, temples started having her own image outside of the temple. Mm. So people come to venerate uh, her in particular and have, they can be believed that there's chanting for her on top of that. So when does the monks come along to, 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 to uh, when, when, when uh, does the monks come along uh, to, to consecrate her? Not the big one in Chantabri. No, no. But but she must have a precedence of, cre uh, mm -hmm. of creating satiety. So that's me, that's not really amulet. What's making amulet? You have to have monks chanting. Oh, oh yes, the, yeah. no, what the, the temple, yes, the, the, yes, the, 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 the amulets and all those, yes. But the um, the one in uh, Dantabri, the big one yeah. at the Donturian, yeah. they had none time and chanting in the chanting. But you know, even tattoo, the one, the ones that the, the, the ones who make tattoo traditionally, they had to fast for a couple of days before they could do tattoo of Bumi Devi. Very fascinating. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, Peter. Yes, I have a question. Two questions. One, where does all the water come from? What, what is that? Where does all the water come from Where's in Torani's hair? The original one? Yes, where, that's question one. Where does the water come from? Because she's an endless supply of pure piped water, very healthy. Yes. Secondly, you said that Krishna was associated with Budevi in India. You found uh, Vishnu, Vishnu. I wonder if if you haven't got another Budevi in the Ramayana, because there you have Rama, and you have lots of Ramas in Thailand, yes. and Sita. And Sita is also the goddess of the earth. And she is called Plough. Mm -hmm. And at the end of her trial by fire, which many resent, but she had to go through it um, after at the end of the story, she went back. Yeah. to the earth yeah. and not not a very happy ending yours is much happier i think but i wonder whether you haven't got a cousin for torani in sita i'm not sure 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 i'
No, I don't think it has because um, she's not Earth, right? Well, in, yes and no, in some way, but but Sita, the reason she went back because she's the daughter of the Earth. So that, so when she died, she went back to where she came from. But the Earth goddess in the story, that's very interesting though. Uh, so the Earth goddess in the story it become part of Buddhist story and gave her legitimized the Buddha at the moment as as when before he attained enlightenment, right? So she's the one who came and helped the Buddha attain the the the, the varas. Another question you asked me about the water. I think that's actually the point is that the water came from the water the water came from the canal so you see that right next to the shrine is Krong Lord. okay so, so no but in the story the water comes from the previous sacrifices of people for the buddha and she collected them i think she collected all the water that the buddha no water yeah of merit, water of, yeah, yes. uh, yeah something like that in 537 lives. Yeah. So the poor earth <laughs> is mostly ocean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So 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 uh Peter, have you seen the shrine, the original shrine? No, I haven't. So it's actually right where it's yeah, the, the opposite of the hotel, <laughs> but but it's right next to Klong Lord you know, the canal. And that canal was the source of where the water comes from. But then the king started having this uh, um, ministry water work that brought clean water and clean it and then coming out into the pipe. So people can, can use it and drink, can drink it. So people actually went there to get clean water to drink. And um, the shrine, the, the dark areas got destroyed during World War II because of the bomb. So because of that, uh, they had to fix the shrine later on. Yeah, so that's all things missing. Yeah. When I went to Laos, every time I went into a temple in Luang Prabang, there was Torani right at the front. Yeah. Almost in front of everybody else. And I said, who is this lady that's always in your pagoda? Mm -hmm. And they said, this is the lady who saved the Buddha. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Very important. Problem, the lady will save yes, you. yes. And she saved me for 15 days, have nothing to do, just trapped inside of a hotel. <laughs> they, they said, I asked the, um, the guys who work at the shrine, what do they do with cloth that people donate every day? Because sometimes they say they got from three, 400 of them. They actually take them to temples and, and the temples clean them up and all those and sell uh, give them back and sell so those come back again. Yeah. Or they take them to village, give them to people in the village. So that was very nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much for your comments and for your paper. Um, I think. We were told there was an event that was being organized, so we'll draw it to a close. But if there's any final questions, or I think everybody would be glad to talk to you further outside. So thank you, those of you that came. Very good to see you. And I think a fitting beginning, our first, I think, of four events in, in promoting the book. So, Nicola, do you have any final? See you in Paris. See you in Paris. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.